They only failed because of a hostage situation that shut down the highway in California. Yeah, that has to be them. They are. Get in the right lane, please. Yep, I am in the right lane. Welcome back, I'm Tedward, and this BMW M5 competition package you see before you is the third fastest car to ever cross the United States. Yes, this is a Cannonball car, and it traveled from the Red Ball Garage in Manhattan to Redondo Beach to the Portofino in 25 hours, 57 minutes. The two times recorded that are faster than this are Fred Ashmore with the uh, rental Mustang and the massive fuel tanks with a 2555. And of course, our friends Doug and Arnie in the S6 made to look like a police cruiser in 2539. Both of those runs were done under lockdown situations. The country was a little more open, a little more free to speed. This vehicle just got off the truck. You'll notice it's pretty filthy because you certainly wouldn't clean up a Le Mans car, right? The patina and the muck and the tire marks and the bugs, it's all part of the experience. It's all part of the value. And uh, man, these are some beautiful battle scars. So this was done in October, actually. I'm filming this the same month this car went across. I literally just picked it up off a truck because the team said, hey, why don't you go take it out for a ride and tell some of the story? And if you've seen my S8 video, you'll already know that you've got to have some of the basics, right? So we've got our, our laser jammers, our light bars. These two are actually very effective because they point outward. That helps you see those deer eyes in the woods. And of course, this bad boy up front helps you see everything ahead of you. But you're probably wondering why would the team trade in that S8 Plus that was already built, already ready to do the thing for an M5 competition? And there's a few reasons here. So number one, this is a much more modern chassis. The S8, although same, you know, a 2017, 2018 model year, the architecture is pretty old. And I'll tell you what, when you drive it, you notice it. It's a little roly-poly. It doesn't make split-second exciting and confident decisions at 150 miles an hour. It's definitely happy to go 150 miles an hour, but it's, uh, it's going to be a little more eventful. Now, when we open the trunk, you're going to notice we've got the same fuel tank. This is a 60-gallon fuel reserve back here, but unlike that Audi, the trunk setup in this car, luckily it fits, but you cannot reach the fill nozzle. So if you remember the Audi, we had that available right here and you could unscrew and put your, uh, your fuel pumps in there two at a time. Can't do that here. So what they did was they fitted this Y pipe here and that way you just pop into these guys when you pull up to the pumps. So inside we've got some countermeasures, the standard stuff. So we've got our scanner that's GPS monitoring what's around us for police so we can tell if we get called in. And you may have noticed that there are no badges on this BMW aside from on the wheels. That is to help the average person not identify the car. Now, all of you, if you're watching this video, probably like cars and you can clearly look at this and tell that it's a five series BMW. Ordinary people, not very good at it. They don't see an M5, they don't see a Roundel. They're not gonna be able to say what it is. They're just gonna say a white sedan and that's all you wanna hear on the radios. And that did happen a couple times. And on the podcast, I'm going to bring the team on to tell their story in a lot more detail, but I'm gonna give you a good taste of it today. Up here, we've got our fleet tracking devices because the one thing you do not want to have happen is you set a record and then folks question the validity. Uh, this is all GPS verified. We can show that to you probably someday. Someday, sure. But the cabin overall looks pretty normal. Everything's run on iPads and iPhones and uh, Garmin GPSs. So you can pretty much tear it out and look normal if you get pulled over, which is kind of how it looks right now. In the back, 
This will look pretty familiar if you've seen the Audi video. We've got the auxiliary tank gauge here, so we know how full that is. And they mount a carputer, as they call it. It's a little Arduino-based thing that helps them monitor their success, but it also allows them to activate that fuel pump to dump fuel from the auxiliary tank into the main tank. That's how it works. Down here, we've got fire suppression system. <laughs> Uh, system. It's 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 an extinguisher, a monopod. This is this is pretty key because when you're sitting in the front seat and you've got your stabilized binoculars, the gyro stabilized binoculars, it's nice to have that sitting on the floor and a power inverter because there's quite a bit of electronics back here to deal with and uh, yeah makes a lot of sense. And over here we've got a binder of some printed pages for fuel stops and other information. I'm not going to show you that because this has a lot of spotter information and some proprietary stuff in there. Maybe we'll share that someday. But enough about the tech in the car. That's honestly just the beginning, the tip of the iceberg. The technology is only going to get you so far. At the end of the day, you have to drive the car. That is what cannonballing is all about. The M5 actually has a very nice key. BMW has been doing great keys. To be honest, these are like nicer than Aston Martin keys at this point. Red start button. I told you the car was tuned. Bren Tuning in Upton, Massachusetts tuned this vehicle and did some upgrades on the cooling system. You gotta remember, this is a 4.4 liter twin turbo V8. It's generating a lot of heat. So in order to make sure the car was gonna be able to hold up for 25 plus hours at uh, the top end of this speedometer, they needed to make sure that it wasn't going to put them in limp mode. That's the worst thing that can happen aside from obviously an accident is a mechanical failure, a flat tire, uh, or anything going wrong with your engine. If you lose power and you're only able to go 80, 90 miles an hour, it's, it's just over. Every failed cannonball has its excuses, and this one is unlike any other. They only failed because of a hostage situation that shut down the highway in California. And holy cow, does this car scoot! This team was on track for a sub 24 hour run. And I don't mean they left New York and got to Ohio and things were looking really good. They're always looking really good by then. No, actually they were digging themselves out of a hole because typically under the COVID conditions, the first two attempts they did in the S8, they were able to get from Red Ball to New Jersey under the tunnel in six minutes, six minutes. In this car, this run, took 20, nearly 20 minutes to get out of the city. It already was looking very bad, but to be honest, the speeds the team carried throughout most of the United States were staggering, absolutely staggering. There was no regard for fuel consumption. At that point, they knew it was gonna be six to seven miles per gallon, and they just sent it. So honestly, this car sat at about 185 miles an hour for 10 minutes at a time, dozens of times. In fact, even with a botched fuel stop on the first stop, the first fuel stop, they got to a gas station that was not planned because they had not quite planned for such poor fuel economy. So an impromptu fuel stop was made and the pumps were so slow, they gave up after about a minute watching it trickle fuel into the tanks and they found another fuel station. Even with that, things were looking good. But it wasn't until after Las Vegas, getting to Cajun Junction, baby she pulls. Wow, what a car. Not even coming close to cruise speed. But it wasn't until after Las Vegas, approaching Los Angeles through the 15, through Cajun Junction, that a man shot himself in the chest, did not die, and subsequently held his family at gunpoint wherein SWAT team, I believe even the National Guard, came and shut down the highway. 17 miles of the 15 was shut down completely. Dead stop. You can't make this stuff up. This team was on track for one of the most successful runs in history without an asterisk and a man decides to hold his family hostage. But it goes to show you that you can do all of the planning in the world and not account 
for something just completely out of your control, whether it's a rock fall in Colorado that's gonna block a lane of traffic, the agricultural stop, which by the way was also another massive issue on this run. Oddly, the ag stop usually is pretty empty. This run, the ag stop was outrageously packed and uh, maybe I'll let them tell the story about that and how they avoided it on the podcast some other time. But but really the biggest issue was the hostage situation and the way they got around it because had they just sat in traffic, this would have been a 28, 30 hour run. It would have cost hours to sit there. So what they did was they went up and around toward Willow Springs through the desert and down. This added 50 miles to the journey. When you look at the GPS, take a good look on that odometer. That is 50 miles longer than any other cannonball you've probably seen. But it goes to show you there is no perfect run. There's always an excuse. There's always something that's just peppered in because it's hard to drive from New York to Los Angeles without having a hiccup, without having something go wrong. But you take as much into consideration as you can. So this time, instead of 30 spotters across the continent, they used 60. So that shortened the distance of the amount of time those spotters had to be on the road and allowed the data to be more real time. But truth be told, the spirit of Cannonball is not solely in winning. Setting records is phenomenal and it's a great feat and it's impressive. But to go across the country in a vehicle in one shot is not just to break a record. It's to have an experience. It's to do something that most people would not set out to do, and it's to do it in a mode of transportation that seems impossible. I find some of my favorite cannonball stories are not in attempts to just break the record. They're attempts to do it in oddball cars, whether they're diesels, it's a solo run. They do it in one shot, no fuel ups. EVs, that's the spirit of Cannonball. And while this is just one sub-segment of it where these gentlemen want to break that record, it's not everything. And, and in fact, you can see that in motorsports. If the only thing in motorsports was to go faster, man, life would be pretty boring. So let's talk about this car. I love this M5, even though I'd probably never buy it. It's not for me. It's, it, it's pretty outrageous, but it, it is good at one thing. It is good at going very, very fast for a very, very long period of time. And like every German car I've ever driven, yes, it has a check engine light on. In fact, they were reading the codes with this uh, generic scanner along the way, and it was throwing new codes every fuel stop. Every time they checked, there was a new code. Uh, I like to use my Carly adapter when I read codes because it gives me BMW specific codes and then I can really understand what's going on with the car. Uh, I guess at the end of the day it didn't matter too much because it never went into limp mode and the car held up. So look, you throw all the codes you want BMW, but thank you for staying alive and well with full power. You can't take a car that fast across the country without having handling characteristics that are going to suit it. You need to be able to avoid bad situations. Things happen. People pull out into your lane. You need to have the brakes for it. You need to have the turn-in grip. Oh my goodness, this thing is just an absolute savage. It's crazy. It's crazy how fast this car is. 4,300 pounds. It's 300 pounds lighter-ish than that S8. Michelin Pilot Sport 4S's. It's pulling the mic. It's pulling the microphone out of my ear. That's how. That's how fast this is. That's how much grip that was. And that's still only about I don't know five six tenths on the brakes. I mean, there's a lot in there. It's almost as if BMW developed a car specifically for this purpose. Had BMW given this a 30 gallon fuel tank and improved the coefficient of drag by just a bit, I would have thought they maybe designed a cannonball car. And you get people like this who just like pull out into the left lane when they're not passing anybody. Of course, it's a maroon Subaru Legacy, my nemesis. If you've seen my review of that car, you'll know how I feel about that. But what's left for Cannonball? I mean, look, 2539 is no joke. And to break it, 
you've got to have a good clean run. You've got to have good strategy. So if you can get more fuel in the car and reduce the stops, then there's one, there's one way to go. You're never going to have a perfect run. It's impossible. It's impossible. The world would have to end. By the time there's a perfect run, <laughs> there's going to be no one to tell about it because literally the rapture happened and, <laughs> and the whole world is gone. But you, because you were the sinner who was out there cannonballing all these years. And in my opinion, I genuinely believe it is possible to go coast to coast in under 24 hours in a vehicle. I 100% I, I believe that it's possible to do it. But here's the other thing. I, I don't, I don't recommend it. I don't. Uh, and, and those of you who think, oh, well, you know, they had a, they had a problem. I, I, I could do it and I could do it without that problem. You'll have another problem. And you'll have to go faster. We must admit that any type of incident at 180 to 200 miles per hour is likely not going to end well. Cannonballers all have their own take on this. And I don't speak for them. I speak for myself. That being said, Cannonball is alive and well. And it doesn't mean you have to go break Doug and Arnie's record or try to get under 26 hours outside of a COVID environment in order to be part of it. The most pure form of Cannonball to me is when you buy a vintage car, something pre-1984, 1985, for cheap, and you drive it across the country and see what you can do. You know, when you limit the equipment, you're not gonna be able to do 150 miles an hour in those cars. You're really gonna be limited to that like 120 to 130 range. And at those speeds, you're really the only one in danger because all the other modern cars around you have better safety standards than something from 1985. And then it just becomes a game of strategy. If you put some rules in place, then cannonballing in its original form can still exist in a very healthy and exciting fashion. I would love to do a cannonball where it was a group of people you know, quote unquote, racing across the country, but in relatively slow and not capable cars. Maybe you put a fuel cell in it, but you're not doing 150 plus. And at the end of it, all that mattered was that you got there first, not that you broke a time, not that you broke a record. Now, there will always be people pursuing that record, but I would encourage anyone who wants to break that record or dreams of breaking that record to take it so seriously, because at this level, these speeds are incredibly high and you need to be very good at what you do. You need to have track time. You need to know what you're doing behind the wheel better than anyone else. And you need to have a network of people to keep you safe. So thank you guys so much for watching, liking, commenting, and subscribing. Don't forget to respect the drive. I'll see you in the next one. And a big thank you to the Patreon supporters for making this content possible. And of course, the Cannonball team in Boston for uh, letting me take their baby out for a ride. I, I, I'm very sorry you guys didn't break the record, but holy cow, was that a valiant effort.